everybody. Justin Jackson here. Uh, I'm working on an update to my best-selling book, Marketing for Developers. You should go check it out. And the new chapter I'm working on is all about choosing your target market. One thing that people don't talk about very much is that some markets are better than others. And what I mean is that some customer groups are bigger, easier to reach, and more profitable than others. A good example of this is Nathan Berry and his web app, ConvertKit. ConvertKit started back in 2013, and they initially positioned themselves as email marketing for digital product businesses. Originally, we're doing email marketing for whoever happens to be frustrated with these particular things in MailChimp, you know? Yeah, yeah. Turns out that's not an effective marketing strategy. But it wasn't until around 2015, when Nathan had decided to go full-time on ConvertKit, that he found the perfect slogan. So then I was trying to think, okay, who are people like me? So, I, you know, who are making a good living online, they have an audience, they're selling products, um, and they're more likely to have the same problems? Yeah. And then I went to email marketing for authors, because I described myself as an author. Mm -hmm. Turns out most people who describe themselves as authors, um, their dream is to like one day self-publish a Kindle novel for 99 cents. Yeah. Um, and they're not a good customer. So yeah. we had to get away from, well, I learned when we did email marketing for authors, we got a bunch of terrible customers who would like churn out after a month. But we also got a lot of help and support from people with well-established blogs and communities who said, oh, that's exactly for my audience. Let me promote it. And I'm like, yeah, we don't have an affiliate program. They're like, I don't even care. It looks like a great fit for my audience. I'm going to help you out and promote it. And so the targeting worked. It was just the wrong targeting. Yeah. So then we tried like email marketing for course creators and like just trying to narrow in on that. And then professional bloggers is what we settled on. Email marketing for professional bloggers. Now, a lot of people made fun of them for this. What I have to say, I got made fun of a lot in the software circles for the email marketing for professional bloggers. People are like, seriously, when are you going to target real companies? When are you going to target, you know, software mm -hmm. companies um, or, you know, small to medium businesses or like you'll never build a business there. Um, but the thing is, bloggers are better at building email lists than anyone else on the planet. Since ConvertKit started targeting professional bloggers, MRR, monthly recurring revenue, went from $5,000 in 2015 to over $700,000 a month in 2017. And Nathan says that positioning was absolutely key to this success. So I think we have um, one of the best possible markets in the world uh, and one of the best possible business models. So if you want to build a SaaS or another kind of software product, Choosing the right market is really crucial. And what I recommend in the book is to look for a target market that has purchasing power, desire, and mass. Let me explain those three things. Number one is purchasing power. And what I mean by this is somebody who has the ability to pay for whatever you're producing. In uh, Nathan's case, a professional blogger is the only person he needs to convince to buy his product. Uh, when you're talking to people, the person you're talking to also has the credit card. Yes. And there's only one decision maker. The professional blogger is usually an independent business owner. They don't need to run their expenses by anyone else. It's all up to them. And so it's easy for them to take out the credit card and pay for the product. They have the power in their hand to make the decision. That definitely and, helps. And I think it helps a lot. I, I was thinking about how many uh, software products have to go through a whole team of people and how much that slows down the process. And one of the advantages of the space you're in is... Um, in terms of starting a business is that there's, you just have to talk to one person. That person is the guy with the credit card. Purchasing power also refers to the amount of money people can spend to solve their problems. So a college student might have the autonomy to spend their money as they please, but they don't have any money. Do you get the distinction? A business owner has both the autonomy to do as they please and often the budget to spend the money. A college student has the autonomy, but not the budget. So that's purchasing power. Number two is purchasing desire. 
And what I mean by this is a group of people that is highly motivated to solve their problems, to overcome obstacles, to make progress in their lives or to make progress in their business and are willing to spend money to do it. Uh, Pat Flynn from smartpassiveincome.com. He's got a really popular podcast and blog. Another one in a totally different space would be a site called wellnessmama.com. And then, you know, we have, we have blogs from people who make tiny houses to we've got Leo Babauta who runs some of his popular habits blog on the web at zenhabits.net. You know, so that, that whole range, someone who has built a great audience and they're just, they're teaching their audience um, every day and they're able to make a living from that. So obviously you need purchasing power. And if you have purchasing power, you have to say, is the desire there? There are certain types of business owners that have the power, they have the autonomy to spend money, but they're really cheap and they won't spend money to overcome certain types of problems. This comes up in budget discussions all the time. A business has certain non-negotiables. They need to pay for a phone, they need to pay for website hosting, they need to pay for an accountant, but they might not have the desire to pay for a human resources application or to pay for social media management software. So the desire has to be there as well. You can't just have the ability to pay, you have to have the desire to spend money to solve a certain problem. Very Shut up and take my money. And then finally, the final ingredient is mass. You need enough people in this target market with the ability to pay and the desire to pay so that you can actually have a sustainable business. If your market is so niched down that there's only two or three people, um, you're not gonna, it's gonna be difficult to make a living. But if there are thousands and thousands of people in that market, hopefully you can capture a percentage of them and create a meaningful business from it. So remember, if you're choosing a target market for your software product, or if you're evaluating a customer type that you already have, you need to think about them in terms of these three vectors. First of all, do they have purchasing power? Do they have the ability to pay for things? Number two, do they have purchasing desire? Do they want to spend money to overcome these types of obstacles? And number three, is there enough of them in the market so that you can have a really good business? If this video was helpful for you, I highly recommend you go to devmarketing.xyz and download the sample chapter. You can also subscribe to this YouTube channel, give it a thumbs up, and I'm going to be sharing lots more marketing strategies for software businesses, digital product businesses. So click that subscribe button and I will see you next time I make a video. Thanks.